Thank you so much, Ranjini. Um, thanks as well to the University of Chicago Center, New Delhi, and Rochuna Mojumdar, who conferred the honor of inviting me to this conference. But before I proceed any further, I have been asked to tell you that um, if you wish to tweet this, if you do, you, you need to. The tweet handle is U Chi Delhi. And I should also begin by saying that I'm extremely nervous because I've never spoken in an overflow room situation. So this is definitely a first. But I'm particularly nervous because I share the, the, the stage with uh, two people. If you know anything at all about my work, you'll know that it's very indebted to both Professor Madhava Prasad's now classic, at least in my eyes, ideology of Hindi cinema book, but also um, Ranjini Majumdar's uh, Bombay film and archive of the city. Uh, they have been very foundational to my thinking about cinema, which is also by way of saying that um, it's really new waters for me to wave in, wade into cinema can um, becomes the privileged um, uh, kind of uh, m m representational complex through which everything can be grasped. I always say yes to that. Um, is is of course one way into my project as well. And um, I am also very thankful to. Boinakta for that wonderful gloss of Deleuze, which uh, you know I never cite, but you will find um, informs some of my thinking. Okay, so uh, without further ado, if the late 1960s and early 1970s, up to the declaration of the emergency in 1975, are viewed as the foundational years of the new Indian cinema, which I shall also refer to here as the parallel cinema. I just like that idea of a parallel cinema. My geometric imagination kind of gets titillated by it. This is simultaneously the time period when questions of gender, specifically the condition of women in post-independence India, re-enters the national conversation, a congruence which is kind of magically exemplified by the release of Manik Howell's 1975 um, Films Division documentary, um, Indian Woman, a Historical Sketch. And here are some frame grabs, not incidental, from the documentary, which I hope you'll keep in mind as you watch some other frame grabs later in the day. A paper is waiting to be written on hands and feet. Um, this is a very important character in the paper that is to follow. So I put a um, black and white picture of her because I just like black and white in addition to liking Apple. Um, now, while women had participated in very large numbers in the nationalist struggle in the two decades after independence, women's questions receded from view. Issues of gender were either ignored or folded into larger projects like poverty alleviation, rural education, etc. The various mass struggles of the late 1960s, that missing decade that Moinagda referred to, um, including the anti-price movement, the anti-price rice movement, sorry, the ecological movement known as Chipko, J.P. Narayan's mobilizations in Bihar, um, various tribal insurgencies, as well as movements like the Shromik Shrangatan, witnessed the widespread participation of women. And while gender was not necessarily at the foreground of these movements, as Elena Sen notes, the very participation of women in social actions, which entailed the leaving behind of household space, comprised a form of feminist agency and an implicit questioning of patriarchy, right? However, the most significant event of these years was the publication of the government commissioned Towards Equality Report in 1975. This was um, a part of uh, the data that uh, the government uh, was asked to send to uh, the UN Commission on Women. This report was the result of several years of research and investigation conducted by a 10-member team whose member secretary was the renowned academic Veena Mazumdar. It has been called a multidimensional chronicle whose greatest achievement was to provide a data-driven, comprehensive look at how miserably the nation had failed its women, whose condition had deteriorated according to almost every metric in the two decades since independence. While in the tumult of the emergency that followed on the heels of the report's publications, its many recommendations 
that were made to address the condition of women went unregarded. Its significance as an archive, advocacy document, and a cornerstone of the women's movement is incontestable. The report is particularly noteworthy for the new which it articulated an epistemological project researching women with a gendered optic. Thus, the authors note, it was decided that they would um, look at the complex interweaving of many types of changes, those, from the point of view of women alone. Please bear with my incessant um, fetish for color coding. You will see more colors. This disaggregation, is imp it is important to note, does not isolate gender from other social categories, but rather asks that we consider how the totality appears from a particular vantage. It issues, in essence, a challenge to perception. It's the institution of a new optics through which gender may once more be apprehended. Um, this is what I'm calling the second coming, um, that aligns the propositions of the Towards Equality Report with the aesthetic project of the parallel cinema. The resurgence of the woman question in the new Indian cinema of the late 1960s and 1970s is then my point of entry into this project. I'm interested in viewing developments in the realm of representation against a burgeoning women's movement, sometimes, and there's, this is controversial, called the autonomous women's movement to distinguish it from the various women's movements links, linked to political parties to note affinities and overlaps in their figurations of the feminine. In the cinema, for instance, in works ranging from Samskara to Ankur to 27 Down, Sara Akash, Bhuvan Shom, we notice a reiteration of the thematics of the woman question, version 1.0, AKA, late 19th century reformist movements through to pre-independence, right? That's version 1.0. As women's oppression subjugation becomes the grounds for a critique of tradition, caste Hinduism, and the unho unholy alliance between feudal infrastructures and a corrupt state, you know this, yada, yada, yada. We might see this continuity as tangibly realized in the adaptation of literary works from the 19th century and new literary movements from the 1950s, notably Nai Kahani, in the cinema of this period. But these films, with their emphasis on the woman as sufferer, scapegoat, and target of physical and emotional violence, also anticipate some of the directions that the women's movement would go in the post-emergency period, which is the violence against women phase, is how it's referred to in the historiography. Another related and perhaps somewhat less central concern of this particular iteration, version 2.0, of the woman question, especially as it's explored in those who are called the kind of artisanal directors, I take this phrase from Aparna Frank of the parallel cinema, Mani Kaul and Kumar Shahani, pertains to the typically foreclosed and yet critical possibilities are of what I will somewhat pompously call women's phenomen phenomenology and their experience of history. Here, the woman's unrealized aspirations can stand in for the uncertainties of modernity itself as a historical phenomena and modernism as aesthetic practice. So to pose this somewhat schematically, we notice two modes through which the woman is made present in the cinema. The woman as victim can serve as a conduit to excavate the unfinished project of modernization versus woman as figure whose enigmatic appearance, hovering at the, at the edges of an aesthetic regime, if you will, can ambiguously capture the modernist interrogation of realism as a state-sponsored discourse. I further suggest that the entanglement of both the parallel cinema and the women's question with the state and its sponsoring mechanisms necessitates the clearing of a space from which such an entanglement can be critiqued and alternative figurations proposed. And here, the figure of the feminine really proposes itself as this ambiguous ground for a kind of modernist reflection. I would like to read together the rhetorics of the women's movement on the one hand and the aesthetics of the new cinema on the other to, to ask how they inter animate to produce 
the, that bridge from woman as victim, which is version 1.0, to woman as subject, which is yet to come, right? As you know from your history of the women's movement. Those questions of subjectivity really don't arise until the late 70s, early 80s. I will focus this discussion on the Towards Equality report and its paratext with Mani Kaul's Uski Roti and Kumar Shahani's Maya Darpan serving as sort of cinematic signposts, really. But first, a brief summary of each film. And if you watch the films, you know they can be summarized like super briefly. Um, <laughs> Uski Roti is based on a short story by Mohan Rakesh and has the barest of plots. Um, Balo lives with her sister um, in a village in Punjab and her husband, Sucha Singh, is a bus driver who lives in the city and comes home once a week. Each day, Balo waits for him at the bus stop with a meal, that's Sucha Singh. The film is set during a day when Balo is delayed owing to a mishap at home. Her sister alleges that she was sexually assaulted by Jangi, a village hoodlum, something that may or may not be true, may or may not be an assault. You're drifting with my modernism, right? Sucha is angered and refuses to accept Balo's food, and so she waits well into the night, hoping for his return. Um, hoping for his, oh my goodness, I can't do two things at the same time. Balu typifies, in some senses, the disenfranchised yet resolute rural woman at the mercy of a modernizing patriarchy that no longer affords the protections of traditional village life. Such a social anthropological subject is familiar to us, not only in the parallel cinema, but also in mainstream. Maya Darpan, based on Nirmal Varma's short story of the same name, has a plot only marginally more developed than Uski Roti. The protagonist is a young woman named Taran, who lives with her father, Divan Sahib, and her widowed aunt in a stately, if faded, mansion in a dusty township. Um, in Rajasthan. It is set in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Taran is attracted to a young, idealistic engineer who is bringing many changes to the town, including initiating a literacy program for laborers, and who represents the kind of social upstart that her father and his cohort bewail. It is clear that her father does not approve of this match. Was there ever a match in that period anybody ever approved of? She is stifled by her rigid and constricted existence and seeks to escape. First, she makes and abandons a plan to visit her brother, who works in a tea estate in Assam, and is estranged from their father. And then in the film's conclusion, she goes to her beloved and consummates their relationship in what is surely one of the strangest love scenes I have ever witnessed on screen, and that I will show you through some frame grabs. Read the subtitles. That's important. How's that for a bed scene? <laughs> Nothing much happens in the film. Taran walks. I'm going to go through some slides so you can get a feel for it. Taran walks through um, the pillared verandas and corridors of the mansion, takes naps, washes her face, fixes her hair, changes saris, chats with her aunt, tends to her father, does some light housework, goes for walks along dusty and open fields and across rail tracks, most often alone, once with the engineer. Um, again, Taran at once embodies a socio-anthropological subject which we might transcribe as upper class woman whose narrow life is a symptom, an indictment of a decaying feudalism, and who finally rebels against her father and acts upon her desires. But once again, this barely scrapes the figurative burden that Taran carries in this film. As even a cursory viewing of the films attest, Balu and Taran are the objects of obsessive cinematographic attention. I showed you all the attention that's given to Taran, right? And here's Balu. We follow their bodies or its parts in profile and long shot and mid-range and close up. The camera tracks them tightly from behind or pensively lingers as they drift out of the frame. Though Balo and Taran remain psychologically obscure to us, psychological characterizations are not at all the stakes here. 
They are, as I have indicated above, only nominally, nominally present in the sociological register, right? Rather, they are relentlessly revealed to us, made abundantly visible. This revelatory charge of gender is also overwhelmingly present in the Towards Equality report, and there too, woman is captured in multiple registers. The report assembles a plethora of facts, empirical data about the condition of Indian women across the length and breadth of the nation and spanning the socioeconomic spectrum. As Neera Desai puts it, chilling statistics, imbalanced sex ratios, differentials in mortality, evils of dowry, polygamy, child marriage, ghettoized education, and professional life values and to equality, abysmal participation in political life. But even more importantly, the woman, especially the poor, disenfranchised woman, functions in the report as a revelation, a figure suddenly and blindingly visible, extracted from the family, community, autonomous, the details of whose hitherto invisible existence activates an epistemological crisis in the viewer researcher. Shattering is a verb that comes up often, and a revolutionary transformation in the middle class authors of the uh, document is a big thematic in the report. I quote certain passages, the emphasis of our mind, from Veena Mazumdar's writings over the years to see how woman begins to command our social and sensory attention. So I'm not going to read you these long passages, but pay attention to all the redlining I've done. And the green is like a build up to the red, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, just um, you get a sense of the, the, the accounts that's given about this research project and then the writing up of the report and the, and the, and the kind of uh, figures that structure it, blindness, insight, under-investigated, unanalyzed, shattered, right? So revelation as a, an optic, but also uh, the affects of revelation are a really important um, kind of drift in this. Um, in this. These statements repeatedly attest to the revelatory force of the experience of encountering the other woman that cannot be adequately described through the language of social science, which must do in the absence of, a, of more perfect expressive tools. I would really like to emphasize the methodological struggles that animate the Towards Equality report. The authors are keenly aware of the explanatory inadequacy of frameworks like class or caste, even as they want to embed the phenomenology of gender in a wider web of social relations and in a longer historical arc. They stress the need to assemble a variety of sources and methods in order to undercut any one analytical frame. We notice this in the struggle over frames of reference in the prologue to the report, um, as well as in the investment in data, as well as an acute perception of its limits in communicating the singular and hitherto unfathomed nature of female experience, right? So the, the limits of empirical knowledge are like repeatedly reached in, um, in, 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 in the report and, and quite uh, importantly foregrounded. Um, the interplay of cold data and warm ethnography um, is what creates the shattering of experience and the movement from blindness to insight described by the authors of the report. In addition, the authors remain committed to the cultural and historical specificities of the Indian woman and her experiences, right? So, here we go. Um, the other intellectual challenge was how do we put this into a framework, they write. By that time, certain sensational reports about the women's movement in the West had started coming in. Sensational stories about bra burning and things of that kind. Urmila Haksar said, this is a fact-finding committee. We should be able to say with a clear conscience that our report is based on what is going on in this country and is not influenced by feminist literature from elsewhere. I would like to suggest that Shahani and Call's attempts to find a new cinematic language that is critical of the nationalist lingua franca, realism, this is nationalism as Professor Rajya Daksha defined it, and yet anchored in local and long-standing regimes of representation, including epic, art, melodrama, and music, aka Ritvik Khatak, cannot be thought 
apart from the revelatory potential and consequent hypervisibility of women in these films. At this historical juncture, women provides the most apposite materials for the processing of a new aesthetic. As such, the cultural and semantic resonances and propositions accreting to the woman authorizes, authenticates, and enables these experiments with form. So that's one of those quotations that I wanted you to think about. Um, Indian women are not pathetic. Sorry, it's not as, as if I saw this woman as pathetic, pathos, as an affect. Indian women are very close to the idea of tradition, and this woman's action implied much more than her being subservient to him. So what those actions implied is where um, the temporal unfolding of these new subjectivities will, you're being asked to, and being invited to think about. The dosa, and then this is Shahani. Shahani's kind of recoding of the cabaret close-up. I would like to suggest that, uh, where are we? Oh, yes. The docile heroine must look like a whore, but must neither bear her body in its raw splendor nor show her human desire. The censorship laws allow cabarets which fragment the female body into cut-out shapes for male acquisitiveness. The nude, however, is dangerous, for she can be a whole person with her whole subjectivity, with her own subjectivity. Can we not restore the graceful lines reserved for the goddesses of Elephanta and Barut to the humans in whose image they were made? Gaul himself and some of his most insightful critics and interlocutors have drawn attention to his interest in the marginal, adventitious, elusive elements when it comes to the composition of a shot. His interest in tone, emotion, rhythm, rather than the organization of space. His much noted Bressonian fascination with the close up and the fragment. His affective editing. I think the slides that I showed you give you some sense of that. I know that a shot finds its place, he writes, when it has the quality of holding you. Um, does the woman not provide the most hospitable grounds for this holding? Perhaps another way to approach this would be to ask what the woman, especially at this time, offers filmmakers such as Kaul and Shahani. How does the meaning that is already contained in the form of the woman at this juncture help sustain and anchor these experiments? As I noted above, the woman is emerging now as a target of social attention. What this entails for both the nascent women's movement as well as for the new Indian cinema is a dialectic of visibility. By focusing on women, the narrative suggests, our vision can be renewed and our attention refocused. And the Iranian new wave, um, the new Iranian cinema. All right. As is well known, Kaul uses lenses thematically. The wide angle is used to provide, quote, universal focus on the extra actuality of the cinematic image versus the telephoto suggests the mental life of the waiting wife in the beginning of the film. But this scheme is blurred in the middle and reversed by the end, providing, so to speak, a new optical pedagogy, that's me, not Kaul, that teaches us how to devalue the distinctions between the physical world and the conceptual one. Ashish Rajyathaksha suggests that this can also be mapped onto realism. I, I might be like totally glossing him like a um, baby, but this is what I understood. Can be mapped onto realism as state-sponsored aesthetic of authenticity versus the cinema effect as that which hovers at its margins and threatens it. A reading I find extremely persuasive, even if I misread it, I apologize. What interests me here, of course, um, is the focus on the mental life of the wife the proposition that she has a mental life and the further audacious proposition that a woman's fantasy thwarts and blocks repeatedly the spectator's desire for a narrative. Ruff, uh, Cowell's refusal to ascribe Barlow's fantasy to a secular space distinct from the sacred space of narrative and, it's, and his attempt to instruct the spectator in a new way of thinking about the fluid and mutually sustaining relation between physical and mental worlds is inextricable from the gender walk in this film. But the legibility of such an experiment cannot be disarticulated from the visibility of women of women at this time. So, um, so you know, the, uh, the, 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 the very uh, withholding of what um, um, uh, Barlow look, sees is, is, is quite interesting to me in terms of, um, of these optics that, um, that I've been describing that seem to make their way through both the cinema and the report. 
As Barlow and Uski Rote and Malika and Ashad Ki Ek Din wait, they convert any passivity we might ascribe to the state into a phenomenology of time that is central to the reconceptualization of cinema as a temporal, as a temporal medium that Gaul embraces. When Gaul says in an interview, that women are close to the idea of tradition. I take this to mean, in, at least in part, that Gaul's own mobilizing of the subcontinental traditions of music and art towards the crafting of an Indian film language is an homage to this gendered ontology, women's affinity with tradition, which should not be conflated with being traditional, right? So it's a kind of futurity. Uh, Ranjani Majumdar reminds us in an early and influential essay on gender and new wave cinema that a woman's gender identity has to be viewed and understood through an array of social categories, including class, and in the Indian instance, caste. She then goes on to demonstrate that Cham Benegal's Bhumika denies Hansa Vadikar's um, social and historical location in his attempt to read her as a bourgeois individualist, while Ketan Mehta's Mitch Masala presents a much more intersectional account of the woman question. Further, Mazumdar links these two approaches to the aesthetic choices each filmmaker makes. While Benegal is preoccupied with reproducing reality at a, phenom at, at a phenomenal level, and as such ends up trapping his subject within the synthetic realm, Mehta's aesthetic is self-reflexive, thereby engaging the audience in constructing a new reality. Mazumdar's essay refers to the parallel cinema of the post-emergency period. However, filmmakers as well as you know, women um, researchers in the pre-emergency period are also deeply aware of this problem. What we notice in both the Towards Equality Report as well as in the avant-garde cinema or the artisanal cinema is precisely a refusal to sequester the woman's question into the private domain and a concomitant rejection of the woman question as only pertaining to women. Let us remind ourselves of crucial passages in the report where this intersectional framework is most clearly activated. The authors admit the domain of private life, childbearing and rearing, conjugal duties and rights, housework, etc., squarely within the ambit of public attention, stressing that, um, I'm almost done, stressing that, please, okay, sorry, oh, it goes back to the beginning. I just want to show you those slides because it'll spare me the trouble of reading. Um, so this, this is the social web that the, and then the economics of gender that you saw, the, the, the kind of economic web that you saw in that love scene from, Sh uh, from Shahani, and then gender and GDP, and then gender and totality, right? So um, I find that really interesting, this, um, this, our need to read the materialist sort of interests of the, the new Indian cinema in, 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 in this diagram of development, if you will. Further, and in a manner quite different from the reformist position that either uses or allegorizes the condition of woman as woman to assess, figure, the state of the nation, the question of gender is a part of a collective struggle and cannot be imagined apart from it. As such, it is neither a metonymy nor a metaphor, but an inalienable, inalienable element of the image itself, right? This has, I would suggest, been rather cu crudely summarized as developmental feminism, but I think the spirit of these assertions are less instrumental than, than that and show an astute awareness of how looking along one axis alone will not only exacerbate existing inequalities, but can never achieve equality for all. A similar impulse to figure gender across in a thwart of categories like public or private or discrete social axes animates um, the artisanal filmmakers as well. Thus, if Balu and his Kiroti, to be quite literal about it, performs her gendered labor of waiting in public, her fantasies too are enacted in open view and witnessed by many. Kaul does not resort to the typical devices of interiority, mirrors, walls, decorative misosen, through which feminine oppression and aspiration are typically visualized in narratives of bourgeois individualism. While doing and dreaming, public and private spaces are constantly traversed and crisscrossed, inviting us to think about the entire social web in which Barlow is located. Taran too repudiates these allocations of space and power as she ambles through the mansion, the town, the slums, the railway tracks, from the dusty scrubs of Rajasthan to the riverine landscape of Assam. 
Um, the, the, the appearance of the woman in, and you've heard this phrase once, any space whatsoever, indifferent to the demands of um, an itinerary, right, uh, or realism, which is realism in this case, reminds us that indeed the problem of gender cannot be extracted from the totality. One way to appreciate Gaul and Shahani's scrambling of the continuities of space and time might be precisely through the lens of the woman's question, where received doxa regarding gender in relation to space, rural, urban, or time, traditional, modern, were being upended. And in my, my, my last paragraph, I would like you to read this, um, great quote um, um, and from Veena Mazumdar where she says again, um, what is this, uh, in her vivid language notes, all this big talk about traditions, 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 that traditions were the basis of discrimination against women. This was absolute bakwas, right? And the report goes on to note how it's like um, new practices of uh, capitalism and capitalist extraction that um, have led to um, the current condition. According to this historiography, while, while women's participation in very large numbers during the anti-colonial struggle enabled them to march in step with time, in the post-colonial period, they were completely sidelined from all the narratives of progress. In the words of feminist historians, social disabilities and gradual isolation from the political ideological struggles that were shaping the nation building process led to the fragmentation of the women's movement and women faded from the public arena. Right, so, um, and then, so in these films then I'm suggesting that um, they rematerialize the feminist slogan, the personal is political, by suggesting that Taran's dreams um, are quite literally an archive that stores the historical record, Taran and Barlow's dreams, not as a coherent narrative, but as bits and pieces of data edited together. It's no coincidence that such a historiography is the stuff that, again, a woman's dreams are made of. With Balu in his kiroti, Malika in Ashat ki ek we didn't really discuss that film, Taran in Maya Darpan, we look at temporality and narrative from the sidelines, what Veena Mazumdar again has called the perspective of the dispossessed woman, where all that has happened amounts to almost nothing. These films, eventfulness leached out from them, convey nonetheless a phenomenology of the feminine. Thank you. Yeah, so just to explain that, it's. Um when Rachana asked me to come to this, I really didn't have anything to say again about new cinema, but then um, um, this, this very small uh, group of films, uh, which uh, I, I don't think this title, this name has been used for them ever before. I don't know if it has. I decided to put them together in a category, and uh, you know, it was um, basically uh, films which I had seen in the 70s, late 70s, uh, maybe one or two of them a little later during some festival screenings or uh, film society screenings, but which subsequently uh, and had completely gone out of my uh, memory. I mean, not memory, but it lodged somewhere in the memory, but not really uh, uh, something that I even wanted to return to. And Ashish uh, knows this. And I, well, I should also thank Ashish for helping me to pull uh, something, some of these films out of obscurity for this purpose. They are, uh, you know, and I suppose that obscurity is uh, well deserved. Uh, but. Uh, it's a set of films which were made by people, you know, which we nolled talent in the Kannada uh, scenario, who were also involved in, the, in that other more uh, prominent s section, you know, the, the set of films, which actually uh, were, you know, feature quite prominently in, uh, in film history as Kannada New Wave. These are the you know samskara kadu vamsha vriksha and uh, the later the you know, the other films of gir kasavalli so uh, but the, you know they were all they were all there together so so you know the experience of so sort of, uh, uh, watching these films was such that uh, 
you know, they would be somewhat uh, interspersed in the way that we uh, got to know. Quite going back to them because, you know, you could see people, or you could see yourself as uh, the other bell bottoms panel uh, you know, said in the morning that, you know, mostly it's a personal journey uh, into uh, another time. So having done which and uh, having enjoyed which, I had then to say something about it to all of you. So I put together a few thoughts. That's, uh, it is very short, so it won't, you will never have to raise your uh, you know, things. Yeah, I'll shut this and then maybe when I, uh, when I uh, want to of this time, you know, we can look at the, some of the clips that were there. Oh, excuse me. What happened? Uh, okay. I'll just shut this. Uh, just so that I can keep this page here. Is it huh? So leave it. Leave it just like this? Okay, never mind. Never mind. I'll just hold this like this. Okay, I'll just read it out. Um, so I start with a personal uh, sort of memory. As new students in the MA English program of Bangalore University, uh, that other thing is just a, it's just my methodological note, basically, so it's all right. Um, so, um, as new students in the MA English program of Bangalore University in 1977, we were all quite excited to, about meeting P. Lankesh, the well-known modernist Kannada writer who was a lecturer in the department. Hugely popular among the Kannada reading public for his stories, poetry, and plays, he was also well-versed in uh, European modernism and had translated Yeats and uh, Baudelaire. A popular teacher, he was even known to those who never attended his classes as Meshtru. Meshtru is teacher. We were eager to be allowed into the magic circle of his students' uh, disciples. He never showed up for weeks. Then one day, we came out of class to be greeted by a man with a box of toffees. Our film has won the national award, he said shyly, and we all helped ourselves to neutrines. After desultorily taking us through murder in the cathedral, he disappeared once again, turning up occasionally. No doubt he was busy shooting. After carrying on in this way for some time, he finally quit his job and promptly wrote a piece in Canada entitled, I used to be an English teacher, <laughs> which, which conveyed the impression that he had escaped from prison. Meanwhile, he had completed his second film and was working on a third. He had lost interest in classroom teaching and had become a teacher at large. And he would go on to start a popular weekly magazine, which he ran until his uh, somewhat untimely uh, death. Like Lankesh, most of the filmmakers of the Kannada New Wave were writers and uh, theater people. Girish Kasravali was the only exception. Samskara, which is, of course, the, considered the first of these uh, things to come out in Kannada, uh, for instance, to give an example of how it comes about, uh, it was a joint effort by Pattabhi Reddy, who was a Telugu modernist poet who happened to be residing in Bangalore at that point, uh, and who was the officially named director of the film. His wife, uh, Snehalata Reddy, who later died of the torture inflicted by the police during the emergency, um, Girish Karnad, who wrote the screenplay based on Anantamurthy's novel and also acted in one of the main roles. And uh, he, was, he also was later regarded by many people, including himself, as the effective director of the film. <laughs> Lankesh, in the role of the rebellious Naranapa, who is the main, most attractive character in this uh, samskara. So this trend then continues with uh, Lankesh himself, who acted in this film, becoming, you know, deciding to make movies. B.V. Karanth, the renowned stage uh, director, 
who uh, made Chomana Dudi and uh, Vamsham Ruksha and also collaborated with Karnad on a couple of films, Vamsham Ruksha and another one. Uh, and B.V. Karan's wife and theatre artist uh, in her own uh, right, Prema Karanth, Pani Amma, who made the film Pani Amma. Bargur Ramchandrappa of the rebel literature movement, that is the Bandaya Sahitya movement. Um, also a lecturer in the Kannada department and others from the ranks of writers and stage artists. Even Kasravalli, in the initial years of his uh, career, was basically sort of, uh, you know, offering his um, FTI learned skills to these writers and so on, so they could make films. It was really in that uh, mode that he entered the, uh, this field. <coughs> and, and also, he initially relied on literary narratives, uh, Gata Shadda is one, and Tabrana Kathe, many of these other, uh, Mani, etc. Uh, poets pitched in with song lyrics like Chandrasekhar Kambar. Artists like uh, Chandrakant and S.G. Vasudev provided graphics that reinforced the overall tendency of these filmmakers to disavow technology even while they employed it. Rajiv Taranath, English teacher and sitar player, provided music for a number of these films. Karnad went on to make f more films along with Kasravalli and, of course, M.S. Satyu, who was... Uh, uh, claimed as a Kannadiga, though you know, he only later came to Canada. And all of these people had a long career in uh, cinema. Most of the others, though, like you know, these other people, they were soon done with filmmaking and went back to the stage or to writing. Uh, some, like Bargur, would return to filmmaking under very different conditions in the late 80s and 90s, but it was no longer the new wave or Hosa Alay, as it was known in Canada. So this uh, wave of Hossa Alay, it begins with samskara, to give you a quick uh, you know, so, uh, history of it. Made in 1970, around the same time, roughly, as the three films that are taken together in film histories as the inaugural set of this new trend. Mrinal Sen's Bhuvan Shom, Basu Chatterjee's Sara Akash, and uh, Mani Kaul's uh, Uski Ruti, which, which is so here. All made in 1969, all you know, finished in 1969. Samskara is uh, released in 70, uh, in May, you know, completed then, uh, followed by Vamsha Vruksha and then Kadu, which is uh, Girish Karnad's film, which uh, sort of is the precursor to the Benegal, uh, Benegal Tendulkar Dube Nihilani trend in Hindi cinema. Um, and Chomana Dudi. Uh, Lankesh's Pallavi coming after, coming after these. So the dates are also somewhat interesting, which is these, these, uh, this early set, which really are characteristically new cinema in, in, the, in the, what I think is the f uh, official sense of the term, uh, in the sense that they're all focused on the rural. Um, they all happen before, roughly before the emergency. This, uh, this set that I am talking about, they come just in the, uh, as the emergency is going to end. Lankesh's Pallavi, for which we got the trophies, was made in 76 and, you know, end of 76. Coming after these big, uh, after these big award winners had made national and international news, Lankesh's Pallavi bucked the trend rather spectacularly. I mean, from the point of view of uh, the uh, spectators like ourselves. It was a new wave film, but it was set in the city, not just any city, but the, our own contemporary city of Bangalore. It is difficult to convey the excitement that this generated at the time, albeit among a very small section of the population, mostly students in their late teens and early 20s. To see familiar streets and ordinary familiar places in the city on screen was one of the primary attractions, I think, that this, this, this film in particular offered. The popular cinema until then was mostly shot in Madras, and when Bangalore was used as narrative setting, as is usual with such films, a shot of the railway station with its neon sign was the only indication. So, 
About a half a dozen in number, these urban films did not outlive their time. They are not given much space in any film history. Even, though, even those who were engaged in making them no longer wish to speak of them. It was the rural narrative, stories of Brahmin self-critique, such as Samskara, Vamsaruksha, Paniyama, etc., Gadasraddha, or of feudal violence and oppression, Kadu and Chomanadudi, which have remained in public memory as the lasting achievements of the Kannada new wave. My intention in returning to these half-forgotten films is quite simple. I wanted to watch them once again to see how they and I had aged. These films had excited us as youth. We had hearkened to their existential discourse, their talk of revolution and sexual freedom, dressed in bell-bottoms and giant collared shirts. Like ourselves, the characters walked the streets of Bangalore and sometimes Mysore or other places and spoke our language, but in that language they spoke of great philosophical matters, of desire and the desire for social transformation. Uh, so in what follows, I'll introduce these films, place them in their post-emergency urban context and uh, discuss their, uh, the, the character of these uh, you know, films uh, as films. In the final section, I'll take up a broader question that relates to the modes of representation that these uh, films. I will argue that while the latter were governmental, objectifying and distancing a reality, uh, seeking to distance a reality that was continuous with the urban lives of the makers, the urban new wave served as a means of subjective exploration for the members of a relatively under-urbanized yet city-dwelling public. And uh, I'll have a small section in which I say something about where, where these films might be placed in relation to other urban-focused films like those of Mrinal Sen or Basu Chatterjee, Balachandar in uh, Tamil, uh, etc. Okay, so I'm starting, uh, 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 you know, summarizing some of these films for you, uh, just, uh, just giving an idea of what they look like. Loosely based on his own novel, uh, Biruku, Biruku is the crack. Pallavi was a patchy mixture of themes. Student politics, sexual freedom, urban dystopia, class conflict, etc. Minal Sen was an obvious influence, but was, so was Basu Chatterjee. No specific focus on a problem or issue, whether personal or political, but a diffuse sense of disorientation, social disarray, uh, anger without any identifiable cause, or with a number of possible causes. The woman's voiceover reflections alone serve as a sort of anchor for this image series, but its own position proves quite indeterminate. Her existential worries are supplemented by a feminist critique of male egoism, but her own subjectivity is fixed in a discourse of innocence and ordinary desires. Homosexuality features among the dangers of city life, as in the middle class films of Hindi cinema at the time. Scenes of Hindu women's daily life, including religious gatherings, are almost certainly meant to be ironic, but fail to convey the distance. Political issues do figure, and many of the standard elements of the uh, political cinema of the time, the absurd job interview, the political rally, the lover's stroll, uh, all feature here. But on the whole, the emphasis is on the existential more than the political. Chandru, the male protagonist, sometimes speaks and acts like Manal Sen's characters, but ultimately it really boils down to his subjectivity, his male ego. The, the, it seems that in these films, the, the voiceover is the substitute for the domestic space that, say, Padatik uh, used in order to you know, activate memory. right? Because you know, when, when he moves into the interior, it's really just like, it's it, it's really a device to allow for uh, narrating the past, which is what the city of Calcutta in its contemporaneous doesn't seem to allow. And uh, there is a similar sort of structure here, and very much Minal Sen inspired, uh, where the, there are interior spaces, but uh, both in alongside the interior spaces, you also have the voiceover supplementing it and uh, sort of um, you know, taking care of, that, of the narrative dimension 
while the city is presented as you know something that cannot be sort of you know the, it's it's like these two sets of images one of which is capable of um, assuming the uh, grammatical uh, past tense which is the essential feature of narrative and the other set of uh, images which which cannot be uh, you know, uh, you, for which this uh, the tense itself cannot be used. Uh, for his second film, Anurupa, which uh, I forgot to even my uh, you know my source uh, uh, Ashish at the time, I, I'd given him a list of films, and it's only afterwards that I realized I had uh, you know completely forgotten this. I, I had I remembered this, but not the title. And then when I failed to see all the images that were in my mind in the films that. <laughs> I actually had. I said there has to be some other film, and you know, it <laughs> came out. Anurupa, Lankesh hired Anantanag and Arati, both well known to Kannada audiences by this time. Uh, much of the film is shot in the Bangalore University campus. A college lecturer of sociology instigates uh, the students to think and act freely and according to their desires, leading to confrontations with management and a final twist in which. He is asked to become principal, leading to students' suspicion about his, involve, his own involvement in the death of a student. So he's treated as, you know, his, his ambitions uh, having led him to compromise. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the, so the writer in Lankesh uh, shows himself with the introduction of a narrative twist characteristic of short stories, like the one we saw in Podatik, for instance. But the rest of the film has a freewheeling, as it prop quality, with songs, satirical interludes, speeches. Uh, in one scene, a typewriter types out a series of fines imposed by college authorities, dictated in voiceover, for improper behavior, romantic uh, conversation, etc., ending with the highest fine of 100 rupees for just being. Himself, Identified with the influential Lohiite socialist section of the left in Karnataka, Lankesh's three urban films are liberally sprinkled with references to revolution, but Maoist speeches are usually rendered by characters of dubious political commitment. <laughs> Various aspects of intellectual discourse are illustrated, uh, such as you know the need for violence, uh, necessity of violence, etc. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, there are some more films, but I'll uh, skip to the next section. Uh, I will now discuss some of the defining features of these urban films. To begin with, one should probably rename them as amateur cinema on the model of the amateur theater, because essentially that's what they are. Certainly such a nomenclature would capture something about these films that the term new wave rather tends to overlook. Among other things, the term highlights an expressive intent, that is the new term, uh, an expressive intent is more important than the representational which the professional cinema is de uh, defined by. The relation to the amateur theater of, theater of Bangalore was in any case quite deep. Stage directors, playwrights, actors from the stage were prominent. The title graphics in particular were done by the same people who designed posters for amateur theater productions and uh, strongly resembled them. Not only were the characters dressed in the ubiquitous bell bottoms and collars and long hair in, of the era, they were also clearly assigned an expressive function. In scenes depicting college life, conformity is signified by the suit and the non-conformist wears uh, these, this other uh, choice of uh, clothes. The intimate voiceover address to the audience is another novelty these films introduced to Canada cinema. The inner voice of anguished souls contemplating the absurdities of the age, the choices open to protagonists, as they try to live by con unconventional principles. The ironies of modern existence, these constituted the content of these reflections. The intimate address is constitutive of community, a world of shared meanings. It invites identification with a state of being, a state of awareness and desire. An urban community is the very condition of possibility of such a voice and content. Although these were in the end an insignificant part of the history, they do mark the achievement of a Kannada modern identity. Hitherto, such voices had been heard only in the novels of women writers. Indeed, it is the feminine voice that first breaks out in self-reflection and is repeated over several of these films. 
And the question of uh, symbolic inscription of the city is the next thing that I'm coming to. Um, V.S. Naipaul once observed about Indian cities that they lacked symbolic inscription. Uh, not exactly his words, but that's what he meant. By this, he meant that unlike the cities of the Western world, like uh, whatever, London, Paris, which were written into literature and into cinema, we might add, so that they could never be separated from their myriad representations, Indian cities remain poorly represented in uh, literature or the arts. This, uh, this is also a matter to be seen from the perspective of the city dweller who inhabits a space that remains under symbolized. Since the 70s, of course, the situation has changed and uh, the absence of such inscription bef in, uh, before that can be said to reduce the city's significance to its contrastive juxtaposition to that other space of suffused meaning, the village with all its associations. The Kannada films that we are discussing were the first uh, to have begun the process of symbolic inscription of Bangalore. Might be. Uh, as the setting for the Kannada New Wave, Bangalore was at the time still small, undergoing development through state as well as various forms of private initiative. Migration from rural areas was adding to the population at a rapid pace. Identity movements, though weak by today's standards, were on the rise, and farmers and public sector workers' struggles provided a counterbalance. The major writers continued to write about village life. The most important modernists like Lankesh Anathamurthy had themselves grown up in villages and moved to the big city for higher studies. The city was nothing in the literature as far as the literature was concerned. The village was everything. Lankesh, unlike uh, the other uh, films I'm saying, Lankesh, though equally interested in rural Karnataka, brought to the fore more familiar issues of everyday existence, which were a bridge between the country and the city. Education features prominently in uh, Lankesh's works. Uh, a subjective link derived from his own life experience makes the city not an altogether alien space from where to look back as if across some unbridgeable gulf, but a destination which repeatedly beckons and may thrill or disappoint. It's a social rather than ideational juxtaposition. In Anantamurthy's stories, the city is not present for itself, but only by inference as the site from which the modern subject sees the rural or finds himself in it, uh, just like in the new cinema narratives. In Lankesh, a subjective bridge sustains the relation between village and city as developing in a history of which the writer himself is still continues to be a part. Lankesh's modernism is not a finished modernism as ideology or philosophy, but an ongoing social experience. If he was the first to return to urban themes in Kannada, it was because the city still stood for him and for his readers and viewers as a space of hope, a space that await, awaited symbolization by their own efforts. It was a concrete historical space, not an element in a scheme. Thus, we have two modalities of the modern. One, a modernist outlook, a worldview, more or less complete, which can function as an organizing principle, a means to measure the distance between itself and various manifestations of the non-modern. The other is a dynamic in which the subject is caught, which does not allow for an objectifying gaze, but must inevitably render the modern as a subjective, still ongoing experience. It's the latter that generates the urban new wave that I'm talking about, or amateur cinema. The bell bottoms and giant collars bear witness to a desire rather than an assertion of identity or a representational uh, you know, strategy. The discourse of sexual freedom is never politically articulated and often shows itself to be susceptible to the petty bourgeois ambivalence, which is prone to redefine sexual freedom as compulsory promiscuity. In these and other ways, the urban films come across as expressive vehicles for collective subjectivities, in sharp contrast to the epistemic relation of representing subject and represented object that is characteristic of the realist cinema that more centrally defines this moment. One more paragraph. Um, the statist realism that was the staple of the new cinema did not have its birth there, that is, in the cinema nor is it entirely traceable to cinematic or even literary sources from the past. Its distinction from the more allegorical interpretations, such as, say, are, are uh, uh, attributed to race realism, has been remarked upon, but that still leaves the question of the sources of its distinction. The epistemological dimension points us in the direction of the social sciences. And indeed, in one sense, its origins can be traced back to the early achievements of fieldwork-based sociology. I would cite in particular the so-called dominant caste uh, thesis associated with uh, M.N. Srinivas. 
Here we encounter the redefinition of dominance in a restrictive socio-economic framework, which eliminates from the field certain commonly available understandings where demographic strength is not an adequate basis for determining dominance. The work of reconfiguration undertaken here renders the religious, historical, and cultural basis of dominance invisible. It achieves this effect by focusing somewhat exclusively on the rural agrarian context uh, and leaving out of the frame the urban context of political rule and overall directive powers. In a way, the power to define dominance is exercised in order to define it away from the urban contemporary. The intellectual humbly downplays the power of his own position and that of the governing class of which he too is a part. Notice that the scholar occupies a position above and away from the social, which is itself now revealed to be composed of multiple societies, uh, you know, the, the different societies, nation, national question, that are, that, you know. because in the Indian state is not the state of a society. The scholarly gaze is thus positioned at the limits of the national so as to better discern the particularities that it contains. One can ask whether a member of one of the dominant castes named in this thesis would concur with this description. The new cinema, I would suggest, is heir to this tradition of sociological realism. It involved a project of objectification in which the collaborating partners of the state and the intelligentsia and the population in need of the objectifying gaze was distant or rendered uh, distant. The Canada new, I'm, I'm uh, cutting it down now. Canada new, uh, urban new way by contrast, what we have is a very different self-directed gaze. We catch here characters in search of education, modernity, love, expressive facility, justice, characters who have not yet reached that accomplishment uh, point uh, of the transition to modernity from where the backward looks acquire an epistemological function. I'll cut it here. And see it. Okay, thanks. I'm running short of time, so I won't take that much time now to respond to these two very interesting, both personal and public journeys back to a past where um, certain issues are being discussed. And what struck me the most was that both of you, in some ways, are dealing with a crisis of representation. So in Sangeeta's paper, for instance, you're trying to look for the space where a phenomenology of gender is possible, and that you notice in the works of Manikal and Kumar Sani's films. Um, and in Madhav's case, though he does not use the word phenomenology, but it is some kind of urban experience, which you refer to as the ongoing experience, which uh, is what you feel has been marginalized in the history of the Canada New Wave, and you're trying to excavate that. So in, in that sense, uh, both of you are trying to uh, come uh, close to an experiential dimension that cannot be contained in representation. And, and so in your case, the films uh, uh, do not have closure. Uh, do not have the distance that you see uh, in the films about the village, uh, whereas in Sangeeta's case, uh, the enigma of the uh, woman in the experimental films uh, comes close to capturing this uh, phenomenology of uh, gender. And where both of you overlap very strongly is the um, way in which you critique uh, the state, and I have to say that the status realism and, uh, and I have to say that, you know, just last week I was doing my class on political borderism in the European context. And it's, it's as if the same debates are playing themselves out over here. Um, that, um, uh, except that the uh, category of the state is missing in the debates uh, or the critique of realism mounted in the international context. So, my question here is that realism has had this very complex journey across the world from Latin America to South Asia to Europe um, uh, and in the context of Hollywood. Uh, why does it acquire this kind of monolithic statist charge so easily in the Indian context? And of course, there is a moment of the new way when one is embedded within that moment where, where you have all these debates very strongly playing themselves out. But we are also going back to a time today from the vantage point of the contemporary. So what has changed in this debate? Has it changed at all? Are there any new reflections? Or is it the same debate that we are want to hold on to? So this is a question. How do we respond to a moment 
that has passed and a very controversial uh, division between experimental and other forms of representation, how do we return to that today? And where does the kind of, the, where do we place the debates on the popular in this return journey at all? And the new debates and the reflections on the past that have emerged in the recent, um, in recent debates uh, in, in, in the discipline itself. So um, the question of the aesthetic, for instance, um, um, and the optics of looking, both of which are very important issues over here. Um, uh, both of you are trying to push the argument about some form of estrangement. In your case, the estrangement is the necessity uh, for the production of the female uh, figure as an enigmatic form who cannot be contained in a kind of realist uh, drive. And in your case, the estrangement is actually creating the problem. Uh, where the village becomes the objectified form, and 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 it's a it's distant it's a distant uh, object. Whereas in the uh, urban films, the experience is overwhelming. It's wild, and it cannot be contained. And which is what you find very interesting over there. And I I was just wondering why would that not have the uh, landscape of realism embedded within those films? Because you create these two orders of uh, the, um, mod the modernism of the Canada New Wave, you divide that into two categories, the village form and the urban form. And what makes the urban form not realist in, in the ways in which you're posing this question and in uh, Sangeeta's uh, narrative, uh, because I don't think you've got enough time to deal with the ways in which uh, the uh, uh, what you would define as realist cinema, how they they were actually depicting um, the issue of uh, gender, uh, and I just want to leave this at this quest this question of the crisis of representation when politically certain things are becoming hyper visible. And that is clearly an issue that uh, frames both the presentations and the category of experience. How do we think about experience and what exactly is experience? And then the framework of realism and placing that as uh, the gaze of the state. How do we then uh, mess this up a little because the category of experience is also a very messy category. And finally, I must say, I don't know what the uh, organizers were thinking when I was made the chair of this session today. It was kind of uncanny to listen to Sangeeta and all these stories. It was like going back uh, a personal journey. But I'll, I'll, I'll come back to those things when we have...